Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the latest Data Bytes, hosted by the Institute for Government and supported tonight by Administrative Data Research UK, ADR UK. I'm Gavin Freegard, Programme Director for Data and Digital Government at the Institute, and it's great to welcome so many of you to our 12th Data Bytes event. Let's start in the now traditional fashion. Hands up if you've been to Data Bytes before. Wonderful to have you back. And hands up if this is your first ever Data Bytes. Welcome. I hope you enjoy the event this evening. Now, we had a few technical problems last time out, which we've worked hard to fix. But if anything does happen, just refresh your page. And if the problem persists, please do leave a comment under this video or on Twitter. Now, something we had last time was the video returning to the start. Rest assured, we fixed that. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the latest Data Bytes, hosted by the Institute for Government and supported tonight by Administrative Data Research UK. ADR UK. I'm Gavin Freegard and I'm only joking. I think I've now exhausted all the video conferencing technical problem gags, but you never know. Let's start as ever with some housekeeping. We are on the record and are being live streamed, obviously. If you'd like to join the online conversation, you can do so on Twitter. The hashtag is IFG Data Bytes, and you can also follow at IFG Events where we'll be live tweeting. And as ever, I would like you to send me questions that I can put to our presenters. You can do that in three ways. On Twitter, using hashtag IFGDataBytes, via our Slido, bit.ly slash SlidoDB12. Please note that's case sensitive, so capital S, capital D, and capital B. Or by using the comments below this live stream video on YouTube. You can, of course, also chat amongst yourselves using those comments. You may have to log in via YouTube or Google account. For anyone new to Data Bytes, you may well be asking what it is that we think we're doing and why you're here. I can answer at least the first of those two questions. Data means lots of different things across government. We wanted to bring people doing interesting things with data from across government and beyond together. We wanted to speak to a more general audience about what better data actually means in practice. And we wanted to put some of the most interesting data projects from across government on the record for everyone to learn from. How does it work? Well, this evening you are going to watch four presentations on different data projects. Each of those presentations will last for eight minutes. Yes, eight minutes. Hopefully you can see our famous timer on screen. There are eight bits in a byte, hence there are eight minutes in a data byte. Once we've had the eight minute presentation, we'll subject the presenter or presenters to eight minutes of questions. Yes, eight minutes of questions. And then we'll move on to the next presentation. So eight minutes presenting, eight minutes of questioning, four times over. A nibble of bytes for those of you that speak binary. Now, this is our 12th event. You can catch up on all the previous ones, including Data Bytes 11. That's Rachel, Kat, Sean, Natalie and Andy from last month on the screen by going to bit.ly slash ifgdatabytes. Later, obviously, not now. Now, regular viewers will know that I usually try to summarise the last month of British politics and government and data in charts. And I'll be honest, I didn't really know where to start this month. I mean, it was the third anniversary of the 2017 general election where Theresa May lost her majority. It was the fourth anniversary of some other vote that had a reasonably profound impact on British politics. And we've just passed the deadline for extending the Brexit transition period. For once, the political action didn't involve any ministerial resignations, but it did involve a shadow cabinet sacking. The government's daily coronavirus briefings came to an end. Hancock's considerably more than half hour putting him at the top of the appearance chart. Keeping track of ministerial directions became a full-time job. It was two years since the government promised a national data strategy. The Geospatial Commission published the Geospatial Strategy. The Centre for Data Ethics and Innovation published its AI Barometer. And we've heard all three of those initiatives trailed at previous Data Bytes events. The Prime Minister announced a commission on racial inequality in a newspaper article. Less than a paragraph of the article's 1,050 words actually said anything about the commission, and that remains the only thing about the commission published on the government's own website. There was no mention of the race disparity audit. We heard about that at Data Bytes in February, or of what's happened to the hundreds of recommendations made by previous reviews of racial inequality. The Prime Minister might be better off starting with implementing those. We had some new data on staff numbers, up again, on freedom of information, too much information being withheld, again, and cabinet committees. And cabinet committee reshuffles weren't the only changes to government machinery. Some of my institute colleagues tried to work out what the UK government's coronavirus decision-making structures looked like. 
even more difficult than it sounds. Then there was the announcement that the Foreign and Commonwealth Office and the Department for International Development will be merged to become the Foreign, Commonwealth and Development Office, or FCDO. Apart from questions about how on earth we pronounced those initials before the watershed, there are also some not unreasonable questions about why, for all that the Prime Minister has wanted this for a while, the middle of a global pandemic was seen as the right time. And all of that was before we got to last weekend. Michael Gove's major speech on the privilege of public service and civil service reform, and the news that Sir Mark Sedwell would be leaving his role as Cabinet Secretary at the end of September. Now, at full fact, Tom Phillips spotted a clear trend on our Cabinet Secretary chart. Burp trend, Cabinet Secretary between 1963 and 1973. Boris Johnson, Michael Gove, Sedwell for the exit, new department strategies, still a lot of Brexit. Truly, every month in British politics is a Billy Joel song. But from the ridiculous to the sublime. Thanks to ADR UK, tonight's data bytes is an administrative data special, admin data being that information created when people interact with public services. It covers a huge range of subjects and presents a lot of opportunities, as tonight's speakers will demonstrate. First up, we have Andrew Morris, Director of Health Data Research UK, on health data science in the COVID-19 era and options and opportunities for the UK. He'll be followed by Karina Jones, Professor of Population Data Science at Swansea University on information governance and public engagement in using population data sets. After that, we'll hear from Kirby Swales and Lanho Mann from the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government, or Mahoka Logo, on the potential of linked admin data for social policy, including troubled families and homelessness reduction. Finally, we'll hear from Professor Betsy Stanko, Senior External Advisor to the Ministry of Justice, and Amy Summerfield from the MOJ on their pioneering data linking programme, Data First. Now, tonight is Data Bytes number 12. Number 13, lucky for some, might be on Wednesday, the 5th of August. We'd normally take a break for the summer, but we might not do that this summer. But if we do decide to take a break this summer, we'll be back on Wednesday, the 2nd of September. As ever, we are reliant on sponsors to keep this series going. Thanks again to our sponsors for this evening, Administrative Data Research UK, ADR UK. If you would like to join the Hall of Fame of sponsors for this series, please email my colleague Pratesh, pratesh.mystery at instituteforgovernment.org.uk. While if you'd like to speak or know someone who should, please email me on gavin.freeguard at instituteforgovernment.org.uk. I love how long our email suffixes are when I'm up against the clock. Finally, we will, as ever, be having some virtual drinks after the event. And um, if you'd like to join, go to bit.ly slash db12drinks. Again, it's case sensitive. Uh, and there's a password on screen as well, which is ifgdb12, where only the F is lowercase. And don't worry, I will put this up again at the end of the event. So that's my introduction done. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And uh, our first speaker tonight is Andrew. Over to you. Good evening, Gavin. And that was a beautiful nine minutes you gave us. So congratulations on that. Uh, my name's Andrew Morris. I'm director of HDR UK. And it's great to be working as ever in partnership with ADR UK. It's 100 days since the beginning of lockdown. The first case of COVID-19 was in York on the 31st of January. And over the last eight minutes, I'm going to try and convince you that a robust, trustworthy health and data and social care research infrastructure is absolutely vital, not only in the response to the COVID-19 pandemic, but also in preparedness for future pandemics. And to achieve this will require partnership working between government, academia, public services, and industry. So just one minute on HDR UK. We are the National Institute for Health Data Science, and our mission is to unite the UK's health data to enable discoveries at scale that improve people's lives. And our 20-year vision is that data science and large-scale data will influence every patient and social care interaction. It's the convergence of math, statistics, computational science and domain, our domain's healthcare and social care, 
And our vision is to be able to, in a trustworthy way, to run studies on up to 66 million people. And in that mission, we do three things. We unite health data, we improve health data, and then we use health data at scale, all underpinned by good governance, public engagement, and public trust. This shows we're about two years old. Currently, we have uh, 86 organizations in 56 offices across the UK. And what we're trying to do is develop and maintain the integrity of a trustworthy UK health data research ecosystem. And you can see that we span the four nations and we work very closely in partnership with ADR UK, who have a similar ambition for social data. So here's a few images to demonstrate that we, uh, we are trying to build a very strong health data science community at scale across the UK. And before COVID, what we were doing, initially we were 37 million pound organization. We're up to about 200 million pounds now. We have uh, 12 uh, funders. We have a strong independent board. We've built a strong alliance of data controllers. We've published 650 publications. And we have a single gateway, which allows anyone in the world to discover over 450 UK data sets for the purposes of uh, health data research and innovation. But what did COVID require us to do? Firstly, to pivot, but secondly, to work in partnership, arguably on a scale never seen before, because as Bill Gates suggests, COVID-19 is a once in a century pandemic. We are living through history. So when COVID came along, we worked with our community to do three things. Firstly, we wanted to coordinate at scale. Secondly, we wanted to work with partners to enable access to UK-wide priority data. And lastly, we wanted to focus on those really important research questions, important for government, policymakers, system leaders, clinicians, but most importantly, patients. So working with SAGE across the nation, we developed a research funnel where we prioritized those compelling research questions which we thought would enable the response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Working with UKRI, NIHR and government and SAGE to prioritize those, patients, those questions. Secondly, in a very open way, we published on a weekly basis, and we published this on the web, to SAGE, bringing the partners together to demonstrate how health data research has made a difference. And here's a list of 10 things we know now that we didn't know on the 31st of January. The benefits of dexamethasone enabled by health data research, the fact that hydroxychloroquine, although the American president takes it, uh, has no value. The non-COVID harm in the fact that cancer referrals, attendances for chemotherapy reduced by 66%. Cancer services, cardiovascular services were interrupted. How health data research identified that people with from black, Asian, minority ethnic groups were at higher risk of susceptibility and mortality to COVID. Going down to number eight, working in partnership with the Zoe app to define that loss of sense uh, of smell and taste was actually part of the symptom complex of COVID, which amended policy. And lastly, using genomics to demonstrate that the UK COVID cases were from Italy first, then later Spain and France, and that actually importation from China and other Asian countries was very small. Health data research has been at the heart of the COVID response. And that enables you to prioritize research questions. So we brought 1,300 academics together and collectively we've prioritized uh, 40 research questions and already there are 115 outputs in terms of publications or uh, preprint publications. To do that needs a data infrastructure. And again, working in partnership across England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland in trusted research environments We've enabled these to actually look and enable the research questions that have been prioritized. 
uh, basically building on the five safe models, which was uh, 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 devised by the ESRC and ADR UK. And as I suggested earlier, all these data sets and tools are available to you on the UK Health Data Research and Innovation Gateway. You can go on that now and search for those 450 data sets, which we want to see better use of linked to other data sets to uh, address the challenges of COVID. Karina is talking tonight, and just to say that we mobilized a superb public advisory board and lay panel, and 62 members of our public have advised on the priority research questions and advised on how we report to SAGE and have co-created how we use health data in a trustworthy way. In my final minute, I would like to remind you that COVID-19 is a global challenge. The UK only has 2% of the world's global health data and that the virus does not respect sovereign boundaries. So last week, in partnership with the Gates Foundation, we launched the International COVID-19 Data Research Alliance and Workbench. And its quest is to unite global data and COVID to act, to think locally, but act globally to use these data to combat the challenge that COVID-19 uh, poses to us. So we've, we've established this last week, working with Gates, Welcome, and many other funders to start to access data in a trustworthy way across the continents of the world. So to conclude, I think we've got to think, what can COVID tell us about the research landscape? Some key principles, trust in public engagement and transparency in everything we do. The UK has a great opportunity but we've got to address the challenges of rapid data access, data linkage, avoid those silos of defragmentation by creating a data as infrastructure so that we can enable a comprehensive response. This will require cross-sectoral data and an absolute commitment to open science in a trustworthy way. Let's act globally, act locally, collaborate globally, and to remind you of the BBC website today, the headline news was around data, real-time data to inform decision-making at scale. So thank you very much. I look forward to working with you and learning from you. Thank you very much indeed, Andrew. And um, I'll very shortly put the first um, audience questions to you. Uh, but just a reminder to everybody watching, you can ask questions in a few different ways. If you pop them into the comments underneath this video, somebody will then drop them into Slido. You can go straight to Slido uh, by going to bit.ly slash Slido DB12, or you can use hashtag IFG Databytes on Twitter. So Andrew, thank you very much for joining us. Um, first question uh, this evening comes from Sam Smith. Do you think allowing NHS medical records to be accessed by DWP for fraud purposes will have a positive effect on medical research? So Sam, welcome. It's nice to uh, catch up with you. So one of the principles of the five safe models is safe projects. And for me, use of any data needs to pass what I call a public interest test. And uh, there are models uh, across the UK and internationally where uh, uh, panels of, um, of the public judge the public interest test to ensure that it is in, uh, use of data are not only secure, but are also being used in a trustworthy way in the public interest. So for the question that, you, uh, that you, you've asked, I would suggest that the public interest test would need to be passed. And my personal view is that I, I would have significant reservations about it. Excellent, thank you. Um, questions coming thick and fast. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, so next question is from Hartley Miller. What level of peer review or challenge and validation is required in order to get into your list of we have established? That's how they've put it. 
So, the, sorry, I missed the latter half of the question. The list of what we have established. Yes, that's right. We have established, quote unquote. Oh, um, so I'm not quite sure the meaning of that question. Uh, um, so, what level of peer review or challenge and validation is required in order to get into your list of we have established? I wonder if maybe Hartley, you want to add something else to our Slido just to clarify that, and maybe we can come back to it. Um, if we go next to Jeremy Fisher's question, are you aware of anything useful that has emerged from armchair epidemiologists? <laughs> what a good question. So, so. Uh... And I, I think I think it also refers back to the last question. You know, what what we're seeking to do is to enable uh, data access for uh, trustworthy uh, questions to be answered. I think what we've seen throughout COVID is the um, uh, is the utility plus the relevance of data to be enhanced to. Uh, a degree arguably never seen before. Now, when would one consider seeing science and data being presented on the six o'clock news every night? So from, from my perspective, I think anyone with a good idea should be encouraged to ask that question. But also part of the effort that we've convened is to build a community and match people, including armchair epidemiologists, with people with other skills and expertise. So I think in terms of ideation, we've seen some great ideas, but one mustn't lower the bar in terms of uh, peer review and critical appraisal of the outputs. Excellent, thank you. Um, I'm going to go to Catherine Bromley next, uh, former Data Bytes presenter herself. Hello, Catherine. Uh, the UK social care data infrastructure is very poor compared with the health sector. What needs to happen to change this? Yeah, so I I think one of the learnings from uh, COVID nineteen, and it is you know, it's it's been a, a catastrophe. The, the the lack of information and intelligence and a huge data deficit in um, in social care, specifically in care homes. And one has to be minded that there are 400,000 people um, living in 10,000 care homes across the UK. And it was a complete, almost a complete data black hole. We couldn't even define key, key variables such as the denominator. And then you've got care at home. So I, I, I think what COVID-19 has done is really shone a light on the need to have far better information intelligence on on this 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 very significant community because at the moment we are still wrestling with major data deficits and unknown so I, I couldn't agree m more with you Catherine and I think we need a concerted effort to address this gap thank you um, good question from Dan Klein here. <clears throat> is the propensity to be affected by COVID as a member of a black and minority ethnic community itself racist, given the poor definition of the administrative collection of ethnic identifiers? I wonder how you've been sort of approaching that in your work. Yeah, so so I think, again, it's, it's a, a, a major learning from, um, from COVID that our our knowledge of um, uh, ethnicity across the UK in terms of uh, uh, how it's collected and defined in, in, in the data sets we have is very poor. So some of, some of the best, actually I'm speaking to you from Scotland, and some of the best data we have uh, goes back uh, about 10 years in the context of a research project that Raj Bapal uh, led where he, he he linked the data to get a a good ascertainment of ethnicity for the Scottish population, but sadly that is not routinely available across the UK. And I think again, it's what I would call a data deficit that we as a country need to urgently address. 
Thanks. And um, just to remind people, we had a really interesting presentation on some of those definitional issues uh, in our February data bytes uh, from the race disparity unit as well. Um, there's an anonymous question here, another really good one. Um, they thought it was interesting how quickly DEFRA, they think, I think it's the Cabinet Office as well, um, acted to get the data out to supermarkets and some other private sector companies um, about vulnerable customers. Is there anything that um, you and HDR UK are able to learn from some of those initiatives that have happened very quickly over the last few months? So, so, so I think what we learned from, because, you know, coming from the health data sphere, we, you know, we think health data is important. And, you know, I think it has. But for, for example, what, what I've personally learned is the importance of partnership working um, and what we can learn from what I call other verticals. So, so for example, we've, we've seen a reduction in mortality rate from, le uh, from lag indicators in terms of the R rate uh, and, the, and the mortality rate uh, in terms of COVID-related harm. But that hasn't been achieved through dexamethasone. That has been achieved through uh, adherence of the public through non-pharmaceutical interventions, so physical distancing. So, so what we've learned, I think, is the importance to learn from uh, behavioral analytics and other cross-sectoral data sets, which give us information on behavior. So health data is an important piece of the puzzle, but I think we will, we will only really derive uh, the knowledge and the evidence for evidence-based interventions when we looked at data beyond our own sector. And I think the supermarkets example and DEFRA is a good example of that. I'm going to squeeze one last question if you can give a very quick answer to what's a very big question and apologies to those people whose questions I've not been able to ask. Uh, this is from Natalie Byram, again another former Data Bytes presenter. What are, um, I'm going to go with actually a number of very good questions from Natalie. Um, how do you ensure arrangements for access to data for research, promote data justice rather than favouring established organisations with large resources? Yeah, so I, I couldn't agree more, Natalie. And please send me the, your other questions too. Um, I said in my talk that we want to support the, the development and integrity of a trustworthy health data research ecosystem. The thing about an ecosystem is it should have, it should be a level playing field and a low barrier to entry for everyone who is authorized and has a, has a legitimate question to ask. So we're not there yet. And what we've seen even during COVID is that people act as gatekeepers to data, which to me does not subscribe or resonate with the principles of open science, which I think is, is absolutely essential. So Natalie, I'm fully behind you on this. It's something that we need to, to point out and address. Well, let's let's get one more question because again, some really really good questions uh, to you here. Um, I'm going to go with um, Simon Briscoe. Um, the most avoidable COVID deaths have been in care homes. So, what data do you have? Um, he says that DHSC, NHS, and Public Health England haven't been interested in seeing some of the available digital care data that his company has. So, yeah, what what data have you got on all of that? So um, Sage has a subgroup looking at care home data. Um, I, I'm, um, uh, I'm, I'm disappointed, Simon, if disinterest has been shown. Please get in touch at the bottom line. We, uh, as you know, it's a very fragmented, it, it's public private uh, type um, sort of data ecosystem. But we need to be working in partnership with the um, uh, the, the care home sector to look at best practice and learn from it. As you know, the heterogeneity across the 40,000 care homes in the UK is significant. Colleagues uh, uh, in UCL, in Sheffield, and also in Edinburgh have pretty good granular data, but it's not yet at the scale that we need. So please do get in touch, Simon. Excellent. Andrew, thank you very much indeed. And please send me the rest of the questions and I'll try my best to answer them personally if that is of interest. And thank you. That's brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. So I think we've got 
I think we've got Lan Ho-Man and Kirby Swales from MHCLG. Hello there, can you hear us? I can indeed, nice and clear. So um, Kirby, over, over to you. Okay, well, whilst Lan Ho's putting up the slides, I just want to briefly say what the structure of the talk's going to be. We're here to tell you about troubled families and homelessness administrative data linkage. We're going to say a little bit about the programme background. Then Lan Ho is going to talk about how uh, the linking data work, uh, the linking process works in practice at the national and local level. Then I'm going to talk about how we maximise the use of loop, uh, linked data and say a few words in terms of next steps. I'm really hoping to show that this is a good example of how we can use administrative data in the social policy context after that great talk about what's happening in the health world. OK, so in terms of the Troubled Families Programme and the next slide, just a brief word to say that the Troubled Families Programme is one of the largest national social policy programmes in the UK, with a budget of just over a billion pounds since 2015. It is run in England through 149 upper tier local authority areas, and the overall objective is to improve and fund services for families with multiple high cost problems. You can see the detailed objectives on the slide and also we publish an annual report which has lots of further information. I just wanted to talk very briefly about the eligibility criteria. Um, to be eligible for troubled family funding, a family has to have two of six problems such as poor school attendance or experience of domestic violence. And that's important because what it does is sets up the need to be able to evidence that those problems are there in the first place and also that those problems go away after a period of family intervention. And that's a good reason to collect better data. So over to Lanho to tell you how the data linking process works. Hello, um, this slide um, just shows that we've used nationally held administrative data to evaluate the Troubled Families Programme and are setting up a similar project to gather better data on homelessness. So it illustrates the process to link data. For both projects, we've gathered personal identifiers of households from local authorities, and we've used a trusted third party, ONS, to process the data. So ONS used the personal identifiers to create a lookup table and send the personal identifiers to other government departments for matching to their data sets. For troubled families, ONS have created a de-identified version of the match data for analysis um, at MHCLG. And for homelessness, they will provide a lookup table to enhance the current case level data collection. So, for example, to see if households cycle in and out of homelessness. In future, we will match our homelessness data to data held by other government departments. So this slide shows the data sets we've been able to match to for the troubled families evaluation. So that includes offending, educational attainment and attendance, children at risk of harm, employment and welfare benefits. So we have really good ma match rates across the data sets, around 85%. The data set includes five year histories and individual and family level data on those on the programme and a comparison group. And that's allowed us to carry out more sophisticated analysis on the data, including estimating the net impact of the programme. So we've gathered data on over 1.2 million individuals and around 300,000 families. And it's a much bigger data set than we could have created using other more traditional methods. So this slide shows that the data local authorities have access to varies with some data sets easier for most local authorities to access than others. The Troubled Families Programme aims to drive service transformation, including the way local authorities use data, and some local authorities have made better use of data. This slide includes all data feeds, but a few have been able to develop their systems with open data feeds from a range of sources. And by this, we mean data about a whole population. So for example, all children at school. Bringing data together helps the local authority identify risks and prevent problems before they happen for families on the programme, as well as those who may not be known to services. Better data and processes provides a better understanding of need and demand for services in local areas. 
A survey was carried out by the national team last year with all local authorities to measure their data maturity. This slide shows the proportion of local authorities within each rating, one being least mature and five most mature. Most mature systems use open data feeds and data warehouses or lakes. The data are updated automatically and accessible in case management systems. Least mature systems either do manual checks of systems or receive hard data from other partners and do not attempt to match the data. So from the side, you can see most local authorities are somewhere in the middle of the scale, with nearly half of all local authorities around a two, which means there is still some way to go. Over to you, Kirby. OK, so I think there's three principal um, reasons for us using linked administrative data. The first is research and evaluation. So there's a set of reasons why we think it can play, um, benefit our research and evaluation work on the slide. I would pick out the fact that it allows us to collect data on a large number of people, both back in time and forward in time, on consistent and objective data. This has really allowed us to use much more advanced analytical techniques. And the screenshot on the slide is just one example of many of a net impact evaluation and the um, what happens to troubled families, uh, individuals in terms of adult and juvenile offending behaviour after they've been on the programme. However, there's been many lessons. The data is complex. The data management requirement is huge in terms of both the security and the complexity and storage of data. But it's also important to bear in mind that administrative data doesn't always match on to some of the sort of social science concepts that we're interested in social policy. So you have to be very mindful about what you're actually um, measuring. It's often more a, a connection with service rather than a pure outcome. The next slide is just to make the point that, you know, it's really driven a lot of improved services on the ground. Um, two examples, case workers, key workers that work with families, if they've got access to the full history of a family's um, experience of using uh, local services, could can have a much better conversation with that family. And it's been really important for them to understand the background so they can start off where the last service provider left. The second thing that we're seeing a lot more of is the use of predictive analytics. This is taking population level data and um, using it and analysing it to identify families that might be at risk in the future. So frontline workers can look out for emerging needs and act quickly, very much interested in prevention and early intervention. The two screenshots show examples from local authorities of this type of work, both predictive analytics and tracking of data on the local, at the local level. The final thing I wanted to, to draw out is the way that this can really improve policy. Um, so, you know, Lan Ho has talked about um, how we use it in evaluation, but also I'd say it's been a really good catalyst for joined up working between the departments. And it also allows us to set up, um, you know, good tracking of, of, of programme objectives. In the troubled families case, that's about kind of following families for a long time afterwards to make sure that the service has been successful. There's lots of lessons, as well as data management, the legal aspects of getting access to data is significant, so is the ethical issues. But just to finish, I just wanted to give us a positive um, sense of future direction. We've got a huge data set. We want to make sure it's well used. We want to build this sort of advanced analysis and experimentation into future social policy design. We think we can simplify the data linking infrastructure. The Troubled Families programme has done a lot of the heavy lifting. We don't want to have to do that again for every programme. I hope I've illustrated that there's lots of fantastic work going on at local level, and I think we need to connect the national and local analytical and uh, research communities. And finally, we need that culture in Whitehall um, of data-hungry, evaluation-oriented policy advisors to work with researchers. I'll stop there. Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, Kirby and Lanho, thank you very much indeed for that. Um, just to remind everybody who is watching, uh, if you'd like to put your questions to Kirby and Lanho, you can do so using the comments underneath the YouTube video by using hashtag IFG Data Bytes or by going to Slido, which is bit.ly slash Slido DB12. Um, and I'm going to go to Slido for the first question. Uh, so this is again from Natalie Byram. Hi, Natalie. Um, local authorities have previously used housing benefit and other data to identify vulnerable citizens and intervene to help them. And um, that's been centralised under universal credit. 
What can be done at DWP level to encourage them to devolve that data back to local authorities? Right then. Um, so I think that's a really good question. The move to universal credit um, has been a big issue for data linking because we've used legacy benefits such as employment support allowance and income support as a really important indicator. What I could say is we're working closely with the DWP policy and operational teams to improve the connection of UC data. But also we have what we call Trouble Families Employment Advisors who are seconded from Job Centre Plus into local authorities and they are able to access UC data so we can evidence it for, um, for families on the programme and we can track outcomes. However, I do think there's some way to go and um, DWP on, on this call, but that's um, we do need to work to get that data into both national and local systems. Excellent, thanks. I've um, got a question uh, from Ben Proctor. Uh, this is a bit niche. Welcome to Data Bytes, Ben. Uh, but I'm interested in what data maturity model was used to assess the maturity of local authorities? Um, so, in fact, on this one, we created our own data maturity model um, because we didn't know that there was one that existed. If somebody has got one in existence we could use, we would like to, to use that. Um, it's a self-assessment tool. Um, very much we believe in local authorities self-assessing their journey. Nobody is at, a, uh, there's not a binary good or bad in here. Everyone's on a journey to improve their data maturity. Um, and it allows them to move up that scale. And we have various indicators. And what we do is we have a, a team that goes in and talks to local authorities about their cases, looks for evidence that the, um, what we say, the payment by results claims can be validated. And as part of that process, we have a moderation of their data maturity model. And again, could I just stress just how, how impressive some of the local authorities are in their use of data warehouses, automated processes. For some of them, it used to be a manual process to collect this data, and it took many, many hours. Now they have automated data matching systems, and they use data science tools such as Power BI to run dashboards. But we'd be delighted to talk to anybody about how we maybe could improve that data maturity model. Excellent. Thank you. Um, got a question from Dan Klein next. How, do, how long does it take MHCLG from collection of all the various data feeds to be made available as a combined set cross identified by ONS for use by others? OK, so I think I'll uh, hand over to Lan Ho, who, who has been uh, really important in driving the data linking pro process to answer that question. So um, at the moment, the data isn't available to others to look at, but we are we are working with ONS to make that data available, hopefully next year, because our project is coming to an end. Um, but the we collect the data from local authorities um, and it takes around just uh, just trying to think off the top of my head. Sorry, I think it's around six months to get from the point where local authorities provide the data to actually getting the data at MHC or G. So it does take a reasonable amount of time. Um, and in our data sets, we also have additional time lags in the data. So some of the data that's collected yearly by government departments, for example, uh, Department for Education, there are even bigger time lags in the data than just the six months for the data collection at our end. So. Yeah. And if I could just add, I mean, I think this is why it's so exciting, the investment in the administrative data infrastructure. So it's, this was my point about, I think we can speed up and simplify the process of linking to administrative data through central teams like ONS. And therefore, in future, a lot of the learning from the Troubled Families programme could be passed to them. And in future, we can just give identifiers over and somebody else can do all the matching and perhaps speed that process up. Excellent. Thanks. Um, we've got a question from Helen Hodges now. Uh, she said, this is obviously England specific. Do you have a sense of how Wales compares in terms of data maturity? Not in terms of family services. I know Wales has a really good pedigree of data linkage at the national level in terms of their sale data bank, but I, I'm afraid I, we don't have. Um, I think though the COVID experience has improved uh, working with the devolved administrations. And so I'm keen personally to see if we can link up better with what's going in terms of family support services in Wales and see if, if we can learn from each other. 
Excellent. Um, question from Ed Morrow. Um, simple, broad question. He says, why are some local authorities more data mature than others? That's a, that's a really, really good question. I mean, um, the Troubled Families programme has been an important funding source for local authorities to invest in their data systems, but it is a corporate decision. So it will, be, it will depend partly on the corporate interest in this. Um, I think some local authorities that are used to dealing with high volumes of vulnerable children and families have had to invest in these sorts of systems. Um, but a lot of it comes down to leadership, um, the quality of the IT department and the central performance team. So as you can tell, I haven't got a perfect answer, um, but we at least we are starting to do systematic uh, work on data maturity. And so we need to answer that question so we can move all local authorities up that scale. Excellent, thanks. Um, Catherine Bromley, uh, again. Uh, hello, Catherine. Uh, can you say a bit more about the data available to researchers via the ONS Cure Research Service? So again, I think I'll ask Lan Ho to say I, um, it's not necessarily available right now, but what it will look like when it is available. Yeah, so the um, the data set that we have has around 2,000 variables. So we, we have individual and family level data, and that includes information about the characteristics of the families, um, as well as information on offending, educational attainment um, and attendance, as well as children in need and the benefits and employment data. So we haven't agreed exactly what that data set will look like when it goes into the ONS Secure Research Service. And that's some work that we are we are going to start at some point later this year. Um, but we hope that that data will be available next year um, via ONS to other researchers. Excellent, thanks. Um, this is a question from State of Data 2020. Um, who tells the people whose data it is that you're using for these purposes before the linkage? Uh, again, I'll hand over to Lan Ho to start the answer on this one. So the approach that um, a lot of local authorities use, so this is most local authorities, is the use of, um, they tell uh, families through privacy notices. So this is a, an approach that we agreed with the Information Commissioner's Office. So we talked to them quite extensively before we set up the Troubled Families Evaluation. So key workers will talk to families that they're assessing about the research um, and they have been asked to put up posters and information on their website. So there's a lot of information out there for families to tell them that their data is being used for these purposes. And that is an approach that we have discussed with the Information Commissioner's Office and we've talked to local authorities about that. So that is an agreed approach um, and seems to have been successful. And I would just add two things on that. I think it's a really good question. The ethical issues at the local level are particularly important. But Troubled Families itself as the whole programme is a voluntary programme. It's not a mandatory programme. It's not a legally prescribed program. So families are persuaded to join the Troubled Families program because they believe that it's going to help them and their families. Excellent. And one final question from Ashley. COVID has shown clearly national priorities metrics are needed, but local evaluations interventions are still needed. How have you considered data across local authorities? Have you done any work to standardise local authority data um, so feedback can be provided back to them to help them improve their data collections in future? Um, I'm not sure I totally understand the question, but what, what I would say is there's been a lot of interest in collecting more standardised data through the COVID process. And in the troubled family space, um, DFEE have in particular been working with local authorities to make sure there is good data tracking on vulnerable children and whether they're being seen by a social worker and whether those children are in school. For troubled families, we haven't put in place a bespoke data collection process but we have been engaging closely with local authorities and trying to have very many webinars like this. So we're sharing information about what's going on with service and what the good practice is. But I'm happy to take a more detailed question separately. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. Um, thank you to the audience for some great questions again. Uh, but huge thank you to Kirby and Lan Ho from MHCLG. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. So we're now going to go to our 
what was going to be our fourth presentation. So over to Betsy and Amy from uh, Data First Ministry of Justice. Hello, Betsy. Hello. Um, let's see if I can I can solve the technical issues. Ah, yippee. Okay. Uh, thanks very much, and I'm really pleased to be here today. I am the external advisor to the Data First program. Um, as an academic in my first life, uh, I was the director of the ESRC Violence Research Program from 1997 to 2002. I learned firsthand the value of administrative data. Many people said that um, violence was hidden, and yet many of the research uh, projects found lots of information about violence in standard administrative data in many government sources, departments, and agencies. And so I've been an advocate and a champion for administrative data ever since. When I, when I joined government uh, nearly two decades ago, I actively used crime and justice data to inform strategic decision-making for the police and for uh, police and crime commissioners. But I also know that as an academic, other acad many people still have a, um, a great difficulty gaining access to de-identified crime and justice data, because essentially what we want to do is inform policy and knowledge in a way that maintains confidentiality of individual users of the justice system. But what we also want to do at the same time is improve justice. So what the Data First project is, is it aims to unlock and enable the wealth of data created by MOJ when it does its work. It, it basically can link administrative data sets, which are, base, which are from operational um, work. Just as we have learned from the response to COVID, data needs to be comprehensive and confidential yet sensitive, sensitive enough to tell us about aspects of structures and processes that enable us to protect the vulnerable. Ultimately, justice is about people and people's needs for state help. And so as I, as I take you through the program, I want you to think about the fact that this is really benefits to the taxpayer. I mean, Data First is a flagship um, initiative in conjunction with independent and expert advice. As we have again learned with COVID and I have really appreciated the first two presentations, scientific and research knowledge is central to guiding better decision-making. So Data First explicitly has a partnership venture with academics as well and prepares data sets for deposit in the ONS Secure Research Services site. Research and social scientists, as we have seen, are public good. And this program encourages academics to engage actively with MOJ's analytic teams. And it does so with a really complex approach. I have been very impressed with MOJ's, um, both their technical and um, uh, their analytic commitment to trying to overcome, as those of you who have ever tried to use justice data, one of the things that you need to overcome is its fragmentation and the fact that there's, there's really a great difficulty in identifying the same person over time. And the reason why we don't want to know who they are, but we want to be able to look at outcomes not just for the numbers of cases that we have, but what its impact on people and particularly on protected characteristics, as we have seen again in COVID. These are very important issues about what is the impact on justice on people and how do we, how do we learn that? So we've found that mapping, understanding the breadth, scope and quality of the information that you have, the internal linking team then thinks about how we can map across um, all of the multiple data sets that we've got, criminal, civil, and family justice data in particular. So for example, if we have a victim of domestic violence, do we know that they're using three different systems to protect themselves? At the moment, it's very difficult 
to find out where those people are in each of those systems to f and to learn about how we can think about policy in a better way to help protect victims of domestic violence. External linking is also really important, and you talked about th that in the last presentation. So uh, it is a, an, a vital part of this program as well. The other thing that's important about um, Data First is it really has learned a lot of lessons about um, how to engage internally with a department, with the, with the data owners, and with the kinds of sensitivities about the information that's important to take policymakers and officials along with the journey of getting data ready for researchers. Uh, the sh so thinking about how one shares that and then begin to have that conversation, as again we heard earlier, about what is the kind of research that will take the whole field forward in thinking about how to make justice better. The benefits, again, I said earlier that I think the benefits are very much for people, um, the citizenry, to have a better justice system, to have a fair justice system. So we are not only creating something for researchers, but actually using that information to be able to feed back to um, better, um, it's, it's really the bottom line to me is better data for better justice. There is quite a lot of academic engagement which is embedded in this program. We already have an external advisor. We have an academic lead to the program. We have um, s started to have uh, a program of uh, seminars, academic seminars, the first of which, as everybody has suddenly had to work in COVID virtually, um, and had an, uh, a three-hour seminar on uh, with with people all around the country. And I have to say, to their credit, people stuck in and um, had lots of questions and engagements um, about this this program and quite a lot of enthusiasm. As I mentioned earlier, it's very difficult to get a hold of administrative data in a way that is confidential, de-identified, um, and uh, research enabled. The internal data linking, uh, if you've got 50 million records, what do you do with them? Well, you're rolling around in lots of data, but we really need to find a way of deduplicating many of the records, but making sure that they're actually um, what I call nominal data. They're people data. They're not necessarily about um, mags, magistrates courts or crown court or family court. They're actually about people. And it's really important to think about how useful that will be when you can then link that information to other departments' data. I do also recommend people who wish to take a look at the open source data linking package, because that's really quite important as well. Um, and that is available now. Um, external data linking, there is now a data share between the Ministry of Justice and the Department of Education that looks at the um, national, and national Police Computer and the National Pupil Database. Very important in terms of thinking about crime prevention, early intervention, and those kinds of things. Um, so that is now um, deposited in ONS. The, the data mapping strategy uh, delivers both a catalog and uh, lots of different data sets as well. So have a look at that. And finally, we went live yesterday. So please uh, have a look on the MOJ site, the ADRUK site. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Betsy. Um, and hopefully we're about to be joined by Amy as well, uh, just in time to go over to questions. Just a reminder to everybody watching, there are three ways of asking a question. Leave a comment under the YouTube video, use hashtag IFGDataBytes on Twitter, or use Slido, which is bit.ly slash SlidoDB12. 
Excellent. Uh, welcome, Amy. Great to see both of you on screen. Um, so the first question is from Sam from Med Confidential. Um, noting that this is a flagship initiative, how much of this work was MOJ funded versus ADR funded? And if that's important, why that split? The um, Can you hear me OK? We can indeed, loud and clear. Great. This um, this is a, um, a, a project fully funded by Administrative Data Research UK. So it's it's um, funding for um, the course of three years, which covers the work strands that Betsy outlined. So some of the work was um, in train with uh, within MOJ. So, for example, it's not the first data sharing agreement we've had with other government departments, but the funding has really enabled us to set up um, a number of work streams across analytical services to deliver on all of the um, objectives it, that, that Betsy outlined. So, given us a an opportunity to do some comprehensive mapping work um, as other government departments will attest to actually not all government departments know exactly what data is collected because there's um, millions of records as, Be as Betsy said um, so it's given us an opportunity to comprehend comprehensively map the data that we hold um, clean curate it link it and and share it. So the, the project has been um, entirely funded by ADR UK over the course of the three years. Excellent, thank you. Um, we've got a question now from Helen Hodges, uh, who notes that the de-identified magistrates data is being made available to researchers. Is that just crime data or does it include liability orders for non-payment of council tax, eviction notices and so on? <laughs> Um, I cannot unfortunately answer the, the the detail of that question. So it's it's um, magistrate court use for to, from 2011 to 2019. The data catalogue, which will detail the um, offence types, will be in um, was published yesterday, as Betsy said. So I'm really sorry, I can't. I'm not close enough to the data itself to be able to answer that. I'm, I'm afraid. Thanks. Um, we've got a question from Simon Briscoe uh, on MOJ. Is there a public record of who outside government got what data and what the outputs were? If not, why not? Um, without such a record, we'd have no idea of the data's public value. So if I understand that correctly, it's the question is, will we be, is there a public record of how the data is going to be used? Is that, is that my, okay. So yeah, we have, so. we, we have very early days, relatively early days in the data first project. So we've, we've just um, released the magistrates court data and uh, we haven't yet had any research applications for that data um, for us to consider and for ONS to consider. So, um, but it will be in the public domain once we get there. So we've made a commitment to um, publish the research projects that are approved under Data First. So it, it will be um, made available. Can I can I come in on that as well? I think one of the things that's that's to me that I learned working inside the police services is a lot of operational data, lots of operational data which exists and are never necessarily cataloged as such because actually they're accounting for the way people do their work. And what I learned inside the police service was was that actually that was very valuable information that enable you to look very differently at the impact of that work and the impact of that work on certain kinds of people. And to me, that's the value of administrative data. And it isn't necessarily that that um, ministries would have a catalog of every single operational account of what goes on. Um, they may on a high level, but sometimes when you start going down, you begin to see some really gold nuggets that, that haven't been touched or used. And I think that once the the big stuff goes, 
then you begin to start, you, you'll begin to start unpeeling the onion and adding to the information in a really creative way. But I think um, it's really important to understand the, the kinds of trust that needs to happen inside organizations to hand over information that they collect routinely. So this is, this is a huge step. It's the first step. And uh, so, as other the other speakers have said, watch this space. This is a new space. Thank you. And um, we've got about three minutes left. Just a reminder, if you do want to pose questions, use the comments under the YouTube video, use hashtag IFGDataBytes, or go to bit.ly slash slidodb12. Um, we've got another question from Helen Hodges, and I'm sensing a theme here. Um, is the MOJ DFE data share limited to England? Is there an equivalent for Wales, given that education is devolved, but justice is not? It is just it is just for England at, at the moment. Um, there are we there are conversations with um, ongoing to see if to see if we can extend extend that so i guess to use betsy's phrase watch this space but at the moment it is it is just england as you say because um dfe is uh england only data and another follow-up actually from helen um if she were to use welsh data in the sale data bank which we'll hopefully hear a bit more about from karina later and um, is there scope to also match to data first data subject to ethical approval etc Long, longer term, that's um, something as a program we'd like to explore. So to share data with other uh, DEA accredited processes. It's not within scope right now, but it's, it's something that we're certainly keen to explore um, throughout the program. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so a question from, from me, really. Um, where does sort of data first sit within the wider evidence and data strategy at the Ministry of Justice? Good question. I, th I think um, so. I, th I think the I think um, as other present presenters have have alluded to, there's um, there's a real need for better use of data and evidence to transform policy decisions and um, I think it's fair to say across government there's there's a way to go this is data first is, is something we're really proud of and is a first step but it is a first step and um, within the Ministry of Justice we're looking to have this basis of administrative data as 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 the basis rather than the luxury and to under start to underpin um be at the center of, of government um uh, policy decisions and develop a more strategic um approach to developing to addressing our evidence priorities and our sort of strategic research gaps in in collaboration with our academic partners that, that betsy mentioned Excellent. Thank you. And I think that brings us very neatly um, to the eight minutes. So Amy and Betsy, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Now, last but certainly not least, I'm really hoping that we can go over to Karina. Karina, can you hear me? Hello. Yes, Gavin, I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can indeed. Oh, Excellent. Wonderful. Wonderful. <laughs> what an adventure. <laughs> <laughs> well, delighted that you, you've been able to join us. So thank you very much indeed. Oh. And um, it, the, 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 the virtual floor is yours. Hello, good evening. I'm going to be talking to you about information governance and public engagement in using population data sets. Before I begin on that, I'm going to talk to you a bit about population data science for context. Um, a colleague and I in Canada developed the concept of population data science and we did that in conjunction with hundreds of people from an international network working on population data sets one way or another, whether as technical experts, analysts, academics, researchers, privacy, engagement experts and managers, etc. What we did was we identified the features of population data science and distinguished it from data science and informatics, as you can see here. Um, those fields of work have quite a lot of things in common, but 
data science tends to be a more general field common to many disciplines focusing on big data. Informatics tends to focus on technology-based solutions and technical implementation and infrastructure. Whereas population data science has its focus on people, systems and population level insights, integration of data sources and types, public good, public engagement and infrastructure around legal, ethical and privacy norms. And it's those latter ones that we be particularly interested in for this talk. So population data science is more about people than data science and it's more about data than uh, informatics. So the department I work in is, is called Population Data Science and we're at Swans University. And this little graphic just shows the centres of excellence that are housed within the data science building in Swans University. Our main model is one of being a repository, that's our main uh, modus operandi. And by means of a trusted third party, we receive population data in de-identified but linkable form. And then we can make it accessible to researchers in anonymized form within a virtual environment. We have health data, but we also have a lot more as well. We have administrative data, education, family justice, housing and environment for a fuller picture of the factors that influence people's lives and their outcomes. Uh, we refer to population data science as the science of data about people and its four main features are shown here. Using data for positive impact on citizens and society, bringing together and analysing data from multiple sources, finding population level insights and of interest to us here of course, um, developing safe and private privacy sensitive and ethical infrastructure to support research. If you want to know more about population data science, there's a link to an article uh, position statement just there. And then the bottom link is to population data science at Swansea. So our approach is one of privacy by design. This is a very commonly used concept with the five safes shown in the centre of that little star there. And it's the idea is privacy by design means that um, your solutions towards privacy and ethical use of data are not bolted on, but are integral from start to finish, from before we receive a data set all the way through to the release of results for publication. So if we start at the top, and this is just going to be a, a brief summary, all proposals are reviewed before a researcher has access to data for information governance and ethical use of data by an independent panel. Then going around in a clockwise direction, researchers are, have to be accredited, their credentials are checked to prove they are who they say they are, and they undergo safe researcher training. Um, the linkage key is encrypted by our trusted third party and then again by ourselves, so neither they nor we can reverse it to find uh, anyone's identity and data are subjected to anonymization measures such as aggregation and suppression before researchers are allowed to see them. We have controls on data access. There'll be physical uh, controls as well as uh, computer science based controls and limits on how much data people can see. And because we use a remote desktop system within a virtual environment, there is no connectivity, people can't email, they can't access the internet or put a USB in in order to um, remove any data. And then before people are allowed to take their results out of the environment, uh, we don't release row level data, but we do release results. Those are scrutinised to make sure that they don't pose any undue disclosure risks to the, the records contained there. So we have a combination of physical, technical and procedural controls applied to the data and to the environment in one, one big system of privacy by design. We uh, take public engagement very seriously and recognise that unlike in what we think of as more traditional research, you don't automatically come into contact with your participants when you're only using anonymised population level data. This little uh, graphic is uh, the ladder of levels of engagement. 
this is similar to the one and I've, um, I've adapted it from one developed by Arnstein. There are lots of versions and the words within them can vary, but this seemed to be an appropriate depiction for us. The arrow at the left shows that the levels of people's involvement and engagement increases as you go up there. And I've just put um, a couple of small arrows then to show where we see the main scope of our public engagement work which is consultation, inclusion and co-production. So um, co-production being enabling people to be equal partners in a development and inclusion, actively engaging people in shaping a development, consultation, gaining views and input. We're not in a position to be able to run community owned initiatives. That would be something that people would uh, do themselves, you know, because we have stewardship of the data, we have to have ultimate responsibility there. Uh, we look to avoid tokenism, although occasionally it may be that it's, it's something rather than nothing. Informing is not, not excluded, it's just that it's seen as a, a one-way activity. And therapy, um, it's just genuinely called this, is the idea of telling people what you want them to think. So we try to avoid therapy, we inform as a necessary part of moving to engagement or just dissemination and um, we, we try to ensure that we have a two-way interaction with the people who we work with. Um, we do this so we have um, meaningful contact and enable input into our work and research and, and developments. One of our main one of the main ways we engage with the public is via a long-standing consumer panel. Uh, there's a nice photograph of them there. They provide a public perspective on data-intensive research and lots of views and input on the work that we do. We find this very beneficial as they're active and interested and they give us some very, very good viewpoints. And also some of those members are on the Information Governance Review Panel. So they are part of the panel that reviews all uses of the data. As well as that, we engage with the wider public by attending events, um, either events we've set up or existing events, carrying out surveys and consultations and research projects such as on emerging data types. Although data used by researchers is anonymised, the social licence is important for trustworthiness. There's a very high demand for data use for COVID-19 research at the moment and symptom surveillance, etc. And it's important we're able to expedite this while retaining high standards of trustworthiness. Thank you very much for listening. Well, thank you very much, Karina, and delighted uh, that you're able to join us. And um, I think it's appropriate, given that uh, you've been talking about the Sale Data Bank, that you're actually broadcasting from a boat this evening. <laughs> yes, I am indeed. Excellent. Just a reminder to everybody watching, if you would like to put a question to Karina, you know what I'm going to say. You can use the comments um, under the YouTube video. You can use hashtag IFG Data Bytes on Twitter, or you can, of course, go to bit.ly slash uh, Slido DB12. So, um, first question uh, that I will put to you, Karina, is um, how are the proposals to use all of that data assessed uh, to ensure that the use is safe and appropriate? Yes, okay, well, we have a, a multi staged process that begins with a scoping process that's done by the internal team, sort of in house. Uh, to check the feasibility of being able to answer the question with the data that's been asked for, uh, the extent of data that's been asked for, and whether it may be more than is needed so that we don't provide uh, excessive data unnecessarily. And uh, an analyst will work with a researcher in order to work out what sort of variables they need, uh, what extent of data they need, and to make sure that they do get the data that they need to be able to answer their question um, rather than you know, not provide enough for them. So we try to create that, that proper balance there. That's the first thing that's done and, and that is checked so that they're not asking for, you know, give me everything sort of thing because researchers love data um, and know how that works. Um, and then after that there's a formal process by an independent panel and that's our information governance review panel. And as you would have seen on the video, that includes some um, members of the public as well from our consumer panel. And it includes representatives of National Ethics, uh, Public Health Wales, 
the NHS informatic service. So, and people who are guardians of some of the main data sets. And they review for public benefit, for suitability in terms of information governance, good, good data governance, and also good conduct for data ethics. And they will do that a formal process before uh, researchers are allowed to have access to the data. And then access is provided within uh, the virtual environment. And then the, the final step really is before people are allowed to remove any results, we don't release the raw level data, but we allow them to remove results, which might be statistical coefficients or charts, it might be tables. Those results are scrutinized to make sure there's no small numbers in there, no small cell numbers, or anything that could be potentially disclosive uh, for a, a presentation or, or a paper. So we have a, it's, it's a multi-stage process really. Thank you. Um, we've got a question on Slido from Ed Morrow. How do you square the need to use data quickly in a crisis, for example, COVID-19, with the need to engage uh, to maintain public acceptability? Yeah, now that's a very, very good question. There is such, I mean, as we've heard with, with other speakers, with Andrew in particular, there's such a high demand for data at this time. Um, and we are very, very much involved in this with Health Data Research UK and other initiatives as well. And we also host the Zoe data from the, the symptom tracking app. So we have 60, 70 projects going on with that data. So what we do is it still has to be reviewed properly, but we do try to expedite all projects that are to do with COVID data. Um, but to do that, uh, to expedite, but still to maintain that high standard. And one of the things that we still would do is, is involve those members from the consumer panel in making sure that that's acceptable. But I'm also carrying out a separate project, working with citizens in Wales, whatever on a survey, uh, it's about a thousand people have responded on um, the use of data collected for COVID, um, and, and particularly around tracing, contact tracing, and the use of data afterwards. You know, how do people feel? Because there's been a lot to talk about, you know, with different organisations, not, not just us, I mean, but different organisations using data for COVID and then afterwards. And we're also going to be running some public deliberation sessions. They'll be online as well. So that'll be another adventure. It's not easy, it not be face to face, is it? Um, and we're going to be doing that with people identified some priority topics um, about the use of data, about informing an exit strategy for Wales. So we are, you know, still reaching out and trying to do that uh, to maintain that trustworthiness, but also to do the best we can to expedite uh, quick, quick data access. Excellent. Thank you. Um, we've got a question now from Emma Gordon from ADR UK and who's previously pr presented at Data Flights herself. Good evening, Emma. Um, can you give an example of the type of research that has been delivered through sales partnership with the Welsh Government um, for the sort of public benefit in Wales? Yes, um, I mean obviously Emma um, is is uh, head of, a, of of the ADR, and we are one of the centres, ADR Wales, and we have uh, six themed areas that we focus on in conjunction with Welsh government, and there'll be uh, there's a lot of interest in mental health, and we have mental health researchers who work very closely with Welsh government partners on uh, suicide prevention the use of social media data and how it influences young people and there's a lot of work going on around that there's a lot of work on housing um, and disadvantaged areas so yes we we we, we link very closely with welsh government and analysts and colleagues there to make sure that uh, the data that we have because we have we don't just have health data of course we have you know education housing environment some social care data um, we now have family justice data to make sure that that data works for people, not just about health outcomes, but other life outcomes as well. And how can we influence uh, policy and practice for the best for the people in Wales? Yeah. Excellent. We've got a question from Sam from Med Confidential next. But a final reminder, we can probably squeeze another one in after that. So if you've got a final burning question, do go to bit.ly slash Slido DB12. Um, Sam's question is, as an objective measure of access, roughly what percentage of papers published by SAIL projects don't have SAIL staff as co-authors? And has that changed over time? Um, just, just what percentage don't have SAIL staff as co-authors? Yes, that's right. Um, 
I, I can't give you a figure, but I would say more than do, to be honest, because we've got so many researchers that are not connected, well, they're not, they're not employed within our building um, that use the data, that they will be using the data. We've got people in Australia, Canada, who are able to use the data, and they may or may not include uh, a sale author on their papers then. Um, but we do still, we still are in the position where all the uses of the data are scrutinised. It would only be their choice as to whether they choose to include an author from our organisation or not, really. But the scrutiny would be the same. Thanks. And um, this may end up being the final question. Um, so obviously public engagement about the use of data is quite big at the moment, uh, given uh, very obvious reasons. And I know um, the sort of National Data Guardian is doing a lot of work in, in England on this in particular. Um, the sort of, what, what sort of studies have you carried out um, in terms of public engagement research on the use of data? Yes, um, well, I've, I've carried out um, several studies. One has been on the use of genetic data linked to health data for research, again in anonymised form within a data safe haven, but again it's about the social licence and there are quite a lot of sensitivities and opinions around whether or not you know you can use genetic data safely. And I carried out a series of eight public workshops with lots of different people, lots of different sectors of society to feed into the development of a data governance framework. And it's, it's based on the principles of the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health and incorporates those public views as well to uh, guide on how the data can be used in a linked form in an acceptable way to the public and if you've got any time i mean i've also done this with uh, narrative free text data like you'd find in um, written reports or maybe from a clinician or or, or teachers uh, on the acceptability of using that sort of data because unlike structured data where you've got very defined fields it's more complex to anonymise uh, free text data because little bits of identification could be anywhere. So that's another another interesting area we've worked on. Excellent. Well, Karina, that was well worth the wait. Thank you oh, very much you. indeed for, for, for joining us. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. So as ever, I am now the last thing standing between people and the virtual drinks. I mean, again, no judgment if you've been drinking all the way through that already. Um, I'm just going to put the um, sort of key de details on the screen while I um, do some parish notices as well. Um, and obviously the drinks do not start until I get there. So you are going to need to sit through them. Let me just put the details up. So very shortly, um, we'll be able to go to the virtual drinks. The link is bit.ly slash DB12 drinks. That's a capital D and a capital B. And the password will be IFGDB12. Only the F is lowercase. Um, all that's sort of um, left for me to say, um, obviously, uh, Data Bytes will either be back on the first Wednesday of August or the first Wednesday of September. So do keep uh, those dates free. We look forward to seeing you then. Um, this is just part of the Institute for Government sort of virtual events programme. And um, if you check out our website, you'll see that we've got plenty of others coming up. And you may remember those of you who watched the last Data Bytes, I mentioned that I was going to be speaking to the Taiwanese digital minister and sort of digital rock star Audrey Tong um, the week after the last Data Bytes. So you can find the video of that on the Institute for Government website well worth checking out um, all that's left for me to say um, are three thank yous first of all to all of you for watching and as ever for some fantastic questions um, for me to put to our wonderful speakers uh, I'd also like to thank again um, ADR UK, Administrative Data Research UK, for supporting this event. And a reminder that we are only able to run this series thanks um, to sponsors. Please do get in touch if you'd be interested in supporting a Data Bytes event. And finally, please join me in a virtual round of applause for our fantastic speakers this evening. Thank you very much indeed, and hopefully see you for virtual drinks shortly. Thank you. <laughs>